every actor is different. They all have a different language. And, you know, your job as a director is kind of figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily try to figure them out and pinpoint them and be like, okay, no, you know, but figure out how they work, what they need. This episode is brought to you by the best selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money Making Business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Matthew Gentile. How are you doing, Matthew? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. You you wrote me an impassioned uh, email to you know to to come on the show and 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 you know tell everybody first of all how, that how you found me and what what the show has done for you because I always love kind of sharing those stories with the audience. Yeah, well, you know, as we were saying, I I, I found the show in 2020 in COVID. You know, I was in a phase where I just wanted to listen to as many podcasts as I could with all the time we had in our hands, and this one rang ran straight to the top of my list because I saw your episode with my mentor and dear friend, Judith Weston. And I thought you just did an incredible job interviewing her about her process um, and how she works with directors and actors. And, you know, Judith is such an important person to She's me. Wonderful. And so many filmmakers have benefited from her wisdom. I just had a consultation with her recently for my next film and, you know, she of course just blew my mind and pushed me and she, she's just so she's such a deep thinker about mm -hmm. film and I thought your interview did a really great job getting to the heart of it and I've seen filmmaker friends of mine you know film school alums like Chloe Okuno and uh, Max Barbaco who I went to AFI film school with I've seen them do great interviews with you promoting your film and I, I promoting their films and I just think what you really specialize in is getting to the core of you know indie films how we make them how do we get them out there but like you said, you know, you're, you break, you cut through the delusions about the film industry. I think you're, they're, they're just real conversations with filmmakers. I feel like when I listen to your podcast, I'm like having coffee <laughs> with the person <laughs> you're interviewing, you know? I appreciate uh, I so, appreciate yeah, that. I'm a, I'm a fan. And, you know, as I'm doing the press rounds for this movie, I thought, oh, I've got to get on that one. I have a few on my list. And I'm like, I want to get on that one. I want to get on that one. <laughs> um, so I'm glad you were so receptive and uh, had me on. Yeah. Oh, I, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. I try to, uh, we try to break through the delusion of most <laughs> filmmakers because most filmmakers right. are, are delusional. I was, I'm okay. sure you were. Me too. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure we, there has to be a sense of delusion. For I, I think I still filmmakers. am. <laughs> I think I still well, am. There, <laughs> to get into the business, you have to be delusional to stay mm -hmm. in the business. You kind of have to be kind of delusional. There is this level of delusion yeah. for us to even do or try to do what we're doing because it's insane. It it's is. insane to get a movie off the ground, shot, film and then when you're exhausted then you got to find distribution and then hopefully you'll get a check and hopefully someone will give you another job again it's just this so you there has to be a healthy amount of delusion but a healthy <laughs> yep. amount not a unhealthy uh, amount which is what i generally run into uh which i was extremely unhealthy with my delusion for quite some time for a <laughs> while, long long time so that's why i can speak about it so clearly i hear you man. uh so matt so first question brother how and why did you want to get into this insanity that is the film industry? Well, the story I typically tell is when I was 12 years old, uh, my father showed me Dog Day Afternoon. And... Oh, geez, 12 years old. <laughs> yeah. It was it was the 80s. It was the 80s, kids. It was it was it was it was yeah, 80s so... or 90s. How old? You look young, uh, so how old are you? It was early 2000s. I'm 32. So, okay. Uh, All right. So yeah. I, I look younger. People like think I'm in my 20s, but I'm 32. Um, so the um yeah, I saw Dog Day Afternoon. I was 12 in the early aughts. Um, and, you know, it was a film that just completely blew my mind. Um, you know, to the point where my father showed it to me, I kind of said to him, hey, I don't want, I want that. <laughs> you give me more of that. And, you know, that led to Godfather and Paul Jackson okay. and all, all the films I grew up loving. Um, but so I, I, that movie really spoke to me, um, you know, it was set in Brooklyn where I grew up. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, and when I saw the film, you know, I was so captivated by Al Pacino in his performance. Oh, um, you know, I just really, it, I felt sympathy for him, even though he was going around a bank, putting the gun in people's faces. I felt so much like when he finally gets caught in that last shot of the movie, when he's, it's all on his face. It's just everything about it spoke to me. And I was, you know, I was into theater as a kid. I was into film, you know, so I was into the arts, um, you know, and, and so acting was something that was kind of on my mind. Writing stories was on my mind. So I, you know, I had a, creative energy within me like you know but i didn't know where to necessarily put it or whatnot but finally one day I'm, you know this is still age 12 
my mom and I grew up in New York City. We're walking down the street and they used to sell at these um on the streets. I don't know where you're from, but New York. York. They, you're from New York also, yeah. So they used to sell these on these street stands. They would have scripts like that were printed. Oh, with, like, the covers they, on they, them. When I went back in the early two thousand the two thousands, I I saw that in front of like NYU and those like they have like yeah like Fight Club and Pulp exactly. Fiction like and the, the bootleg bootleg scripts basically it, exactly like they printed off like Drew Scriptorama and like Drew put a put a cover with the like yes yeah, I'm colored a colored one colored one <laughs> exactly. sometimes exactly. they put the poster like but it was black and white version right of the or like yeah or some generic still from the film like I think Dog Day Afternoon it was the picture of like him holding the woman holding Sylvia outside the bank so i saw this script on the street scene. i was like oh they had all these scripts and i saw a dog day afternoon i was eyeing it and my mom sees that and so she bought me the screenplay for ten dollars as a hanukkah present and i took the screenplay i read it and i had a vhs and i watched the movie and i read the script i watched the film and that was the first time i saw in my own life that like oh my god I, words on a page could become images on a screen and I was just really fascinated by that. And I loved the screenplay architecture. Frank Pearson, who wrote the script, was you know one of my favorite writers. Cool Hand Luke, I saw shortly after, and that also became one of my all-time favorites. I know Ryan Philippi, who's in the movie, um, said that Paul Newman and Cool Hand Luke was the reason he became an actor. So you sure. know, I think there's there's a lot of you know these movies, and and Frank Pearson was an incredible screenwriter, um, <clears throat> and he actually was also the artistic director of AFI, um, but he passed right before I started as a student. So you know. Dog Day Afternoon was kind of that one movie. And then there was another film watching experience that really kicked me out the door. Senior year of high school, my English teacher showed Akira Curse. I was a rod um, in, a, in, a, in a King Lear class. And it was a class just, it was actually a class. It was interesting. This teacher was cool. He did a class that was called King Lear to Endgame. So it was Samuel Beckett's Endgame and King Lear. And about existentialism and all that. I mean, you're 17, you're, in, you're, you're an English kid. You're like, oh, so mind-blowing. And um, I loved King Lear as a play, but the film, Ron, just shook the box. And, you know, it's funny because when I saw it, we saw it in, like, segments because it's high school. So they show you, like, 30 minutes. And it's a long movie. So it took, like, four weeks to watch Ron. But I couldn't get anywhere. So I was like, I really want to finish Ron, like, so badly. But seeing Ron and more than that, reading about the, the process of how Kurosawa made that film. You know how he was 75 years old and he was going blind and he was his wife who he had been with his whole life and career had just passed away and he mourned for two days and then went back to filming how he built castles and blew them up and like for real and the costumes and the extras and the, and i just thought the madness of this was so interesting to me and i just you know he quickly became my favorite director of all time he still is i have a seven samurai poster on my apartment um, you know, I just love Curacao more. You know, I love a lot of great directors, but he's my, that's my all-time spirit I, animal girl. I'll, I will tell you that the, uh, I, I own two autographs. Uh, one of them is Akira Kurosawa. No, what do you I have, I have, when we get off, I'll grab it. It's sitting over there. I'll grab it and I'll show it to you. And the other one is George Lucas, uh, which I got on a, on a Star Wars and, lunchbox personally. And that's so his nice. disciple. Um, you know, yes. at, at the world premiere of this film, um, American Murder, I will premiere it at the Terramina Film Fest in Sicily. And uh, Francis Ford Coppola was there showing The Godfather the night before my film screened. <laughs> and I got to meet him and I, and, and, and I asked him about uh, Kurosawa and like his stories. And they were great. He's talking about how they would like go to the steakhouse and talk for hours. And, oh my um, God, I could I, imagine. I, I, I asked Coppola, um, he asked me what my favorite Kurosawa film was. And I said, Ron. And, he, he said back, oh, why is the bad sleep? Well, it's, it's like, of course I know that because just, you, you stole the cake scene for the Godfather and the wedding. <laughs> they stole the shots of that. But um, he, uh, then Coble asked me, he was going like, okay, so you, you've seen this one. And then basically he goes for me like, you know, Curse on me, I think 30 feature films total, something like that. So he basically goes about 12. I've seen them all. And then he gets to one and I haven't. I'm blanking what's called. I'll look it up for you after. But it was really funny. He stumped me finally. And I was like, do I lie and tell him I've seen it? Or do I just tell the truth? And I told the truth. <laughs> but it's apparently a lighthearted comedy one that he did. I mean, he just made so many incredible films and masterpieces. And, um, you know, I think Coppola's famous quote was like, 
most filmmakers make one or two masterpieces, you know, Kurosawa only made eight um, to 10. <laughs> like it's, you know, it's, and, and he made them across such a, uh, and I know a lot of filmmakers have cited him, like Florence Kazan said, you know, compares him to Shakespeare or the Beatles, you know, and yeah, he's just an incredible, incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like him and Kubrick for me. It's Kurosawa and Kubrick. Uh, those, yeah. those are the, they, they made, you know, masterpieces. Like they just come in yeah. and they just do what they do. But it's pretty remarkable. Sure. Now on your, on your filmmaking path, um, based on your IMDb, which I was looking at, you did a good amount of shorts. Uh, I did. And you made a good amount of short films before you even got to AFI. If that is mm-hmm. that correct? Um, yeah, you know, I did. I, you know, my film path was, you know, I, in high school, I made like, I think like one or two with my brother actually, who did the score for the film. Um, he's a class, my brother's a classical pianist and conductor. Sure. And, uh, this was his first film score actually. Um, nice. And he did an incredible job. He just won an award yesterday. And the price, and I'm assuming the price was right. I'm assuming the price was right back then. What's that? The price was right for hiring your brother. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was very inexpensive. He's still, we're both inexpensive, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the price was right. Uh, no, so he was, yeah, but we we wrote, you know, we were kind of like the Gentile brothers in high school. We made a couple of movies and whatnot. I don't know if those are on IMDb. They might be. Um, I have to see, IMDb keeps everything on there. I know a lot of people try to get stuff erased from them and they never do it. Um, so they are, they are extensive or exhaustive. Um, but I made a couple of films in high school. You know, I, I, in college, I did a liberal arts degree. I went to Connecticut college. Um, you know, I majored in English and film studies. Um, but it was a semester abroad where I went to the family film school in Prague, which I'm sure someone on this mm-hmm. podcast has talked about before. A lot of filmmakers kind of seem to have come through that. And that was my first time like, experiencing film conservatory. And I made a short film that I adapted from a Hemingway story um, called Cat in the Rain that, um, you know, that was my first time making a film where I was like, oh, you know, the, this is it. It's, you know, writing and directing is what I want to do. Like, for sure. You know, it's kind of always there in the background, you know. But, like, I remember being in high school, I was, like, really obsessed with acting. Like, that was, like, my passion. And I had a teacher kind of say to me, a great drama teacher, who was a good actor himself and had worked and, you know, had, had, was teaching in between jobs. And he worked with me a lot. And I kind of asked him, I was like, do I have what it takes to be an actor? And he looked at me and he was like, you want to know the truth? Like, maybe, but I think you're a director or screen. He saw it at me. And I was really grateful. At the time, I was actually kind of pissed at him because I wanted him to say it was going to be the next, you know, Marlon Brando. But, <laughs> of course. but now, in retrospect, I'm like, what a great teacher because he really told me the truth and, you know, pushed me toward, he could sense the passion for the arts, but he saw it as being maybe used in the wrong place. And so, um, so you know, but around yeah junior year of college that was when my when i did that semester abroad in prague at the family film school that was kind of like i would say my point of no return to use screenwriting terms uh you know after that i was like i'm gonna go be a director whatever it takes and then yeah so so when you're on your journey now i'm assuming you're getting paid left and right you're making tons of cash uh, as a director, right? Just tons and I mean, tons and tons of cash all it's, the way through. I don't know uh, what to do with all of it. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was kind of like, uh, it was kind of like uh, Pablo Escobar. You were like burying it in the back. There was just so much cash. <laughs> so over the years, uh, you know, because it looked like from when you started to when you finally got um, your first uh, American, American Murder is your first feature, correct? Yes. So, so from the point of you getting your first feature done, you did a whole bunch of short films. I assume you weren't getting paid for these short films. Uh, you weren't making a no. tremendous amount of money. So this is a thing I love asking filmmakers because so many of us listening right now are going through this. How did you keep mm-hmm. going? How did you wake up in I the morning going, am I on the right path? Because this is, we're talking about better part of a decade. And yes, you're at school and you're, and you're, you know, you're at FI, you're in Prague. I get that part of it. And you're, when you're surrounded by that, the delusion continues because you're surrounded by filmmakers and film teachers and and you're learning and you're just like, yeah. But at a certain point you have to go, you know, how many more, I'm assuming you had a few no's along the way as well. Uh, oh, yeah. so uh, how did you, so what, what tips, what, how yeah. did you keep going? Well, yeah, I can definitely talk about the path because, you know, when I, you know, so when I graduated college and decided, okay, I want to be a filmmaker, it's like, great. Who doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who doesn't want to be a director or screenwriter? So, you know, or actor, right? And so my path, so my first job in the industry, I actually, I mean, I had a lot of internships throughout college, but I actually worked at William Morris Endeavor in the mailroom. 
and then I became an assistant there. Um, and with one week's paycheck, which at the time I think was $670, I made a short film for that amount of money. And that's the film that got me into AFI, which is not a cheap film school to go to as long. No, it's not. And, um, you know, so I went to AFI and was very, felt very lucky to be there. It was, I think, the youngest director there, one of them at least, because um, AFI tends to skew older in terms of the applicants <clears> it takes to graduate school, not an undergrad. And, um, you know, but I had such a talented class. Like I said, Max Barbacow was my class. Uh, Chloe Okuno was the year before me. This director, Akasha Stevenson, who you know, just booked the Omen film and has been doing TV for five years, was my mm -hmm. classmate. So I had a really, I think, I hope we become a what was in the water that year class because there are so many talented directors who I think are, you know, because they graduated now six, seven years ago. And I think there's a lot of them that are going to come out and you know, blow people's minds. So it was... Mm -hmm. It was quite a, a class. It was a, <laughs> they were talented <laughs> to the point where it scared me. These, these people were good. Um, and so, but you know, you graduate film school. And in my case, I was quite lucky. My short, my thesis short. Well, what's cool about AFI actually is your first year, you make three, what they call cycle films, where, you know, you make them really cheap and you, you know, like the, you, they make them for like $5,000 budgets, right? And you like, you go out, you shoot them in a weekend, you come back, you at them, and then you, you screen them for your peers and they <laughs> tear them apart. Assault you and up on stage and public. My first press conference for American Murder in, in Terramina, which went very well, only reminded me of it just from the physical act of walking up onto a stage to be like, you know, to be a talk to or ask questions. Um, but in the case of that class and workshop, you specifically would go up on stage. And a lot of filmmakers have talked about how it just made them, you know, throw up on the way to school or, or whatnot. But it was, I, it was really great, honestly, though, because it really prepares you for the industry because, you know, when you do a test screening of a movie after that, nothing really faces you. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it was, it was an incredible opportunity, but so, you know, you graduate film school. And in my case, you know, my first three films I made that year were not overly exceptional. My third one was my best, so I was getting better. But then you make a thesis film your second year. And for me, my thesis film, Frontman, um, which was probably at this point, like short film, six or seven in the game. Um, that one really opened a lot of doors, won the student Emmy, got a lot of festival traction. Um, and I had the opportunity, actually, I was paid to do one short but very little money um, by AFI to come back and direct Lawman um, because the director of the year below me had dropped out and left the team. And so they needed a director. So they paid me like a TA salary. Um, and I was able to do that. And that was actually my first technical, you know, directing for hire job. It didn't feel like that since the movie I was extremely passionate about, but that, you know, was the first time I think I got paid to direct. Um, and, you know, when I graduated film school, I kind of was in a bit of an awkward place. So I was like, hmm, I was like, you know, do I, you know, because I was an assistant before, I was like, well, do I go try to be an assistant to a director again? And I had some kind of almost there. Um, and I think that's a totally valid path that I know a lot of people have done. But what I was sensing was I kind of needed to embrace the indie film hustle and the entrepreneurial way of, you know, you know, support myself, get through this work, but like, don't work for someone, you know, like an A-list director, because you're going to be working for them 17 hours a day. You'll have no time to work on your own stuff. And because I was having traction with my films, I was like, I need to work towards getting my first feature made. And so, you know, I did, when I graduated, I, mean, I did all kinds of gigs uh, from, you know, I did reality TV under a fake name. Um, I did like these bad, awful like cooking shows. You know, I did Alan, Alan Smithy, Alan Smithy, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah, I think it was Sean something. Um, but you know, yeah, and, and I did whatever I could, you know, to like keep the <laughs> keep the lights on, live really cheap, ate ramen a lot, and you know, would write my scripts, and then I'd be like, oh, I need to go do another gig. But finally, what actually ended up sustaining me through my years up to American Murderer was script reading. Um, oh, know, I was very qualified. Script, yeah. I was yeah. qualified for that because I had worked at William Morris, and that became the easiest and most sustainable way for me to, you know, work consistently and be able to write my own scripts, and you know, have the flexibility to be able to stop if I needed to, or you know, binge down <laughs> right and read a bunch. But and it also was for me, script reading was my screenwriting school. You know, mm -hmm. AFI was my directing school, and 
script reading for. I can't say the sites right now because you know they 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 like anonymity, but you know, mm -hmm. think big screenwriting competitions or you mm -hmm. know sites like that. And um, you know, they were my screenwriting school. They really allowed. They gave me a way to support myself. So that I, like without them, I don't think I I would not be here. Um, because that gave me a way to support myself as I became a professional writer and director. Um, and so the path towards getting American Murder made, you know, a year or two out of AFI, I thought I thought I was hot shit because my film won awards. And then I realized that after, <laughs> you know, after five seconds, nobody gives a shit anymore. <laughs> no, the next, stop it. You know, you mean no. they, they didn't just walk up and go, how much money did you need? And all you right, have is money right, 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 right. Yeah. And you think you're good because you want an award. And you're like, oh my God. And then no one cares. And they're, because they ask you the first thing you do when you make, you know, anything decent, as they say, what's your next thing? you know what's your next three things let alone what's your next, next right what's your next three things? exactly it's a what's next business as we know and so you know i was kind of in between a couple you know because again i think and if i can give some advice which i don't know if you should listen to but you know it you know when you leave film school i think a lot of people have different visions of like what they're or even if you don't go to film school because you know <laughs> there probably are more greater filmmakers that didn't go to film school that did arguably who knows but um you know whatever it is when you decide to build a career for yourself, you know, like, I don't know. I think everyone's vision of their own career probably changed <laughs> at some point along the way. Everyone, I'm very, every single one. Yeah. Like, cause I never set out to be necessarily Mr. True crime filmmaker, you know? Um, now American murder, I could say, and one thing I'm very proud of is it is 100% a movie I wanted to make. It's not a film I was like hired to do. I mean, I wasn't contracts, I guess it's in terms of the contracts, but I, but I, did, it was a film that came from inside, very personal, very deep rooted, not, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that, very, but, but we know that it's very hard to get movies made and, you know, everyone has to figure out how to work in the business and how to make films, how to get financing for them. And it's a constant struggle and grind. So how, so that was my next question. How did you get American murder, American murder off the ground? Because you have a, a really great cast. You. Um, you know, I won't ask you the budget, but it looks good. It doesn't Thank look you. like you made it for five grand. So it was all made uh, for five grand. It was all made for, it was all made for five grand. <laughs> yeah. We sold it for 50 uh, and I'm exactly. done. And I'm I Highest and sale I'm, you've I'm, never heard of. <laughs> exactly. The highest sale ever for a $5,000 movie you've never heard about. Um, I saw, yeah, I, wrote, I, I signed non disclosures. I can't even talk about it. Um, <laughs> but how did you get this? Pro I, know, I know you did a short film version of it. Uh, yeah. And that I'm assuming, because that's a, that's a myth as well, that so many filmmakers are like, I'm going to make a short film version of the script, and hopefully that's going to get me to the feature. I did that multiple times in my career. It never right. worked out. Uh, Interesting. But it, but it does work for some people, but I've heard in most of the times it doesn't work because it's just so damn hard. So how did you get this thing off the ground? How did you get your cast to agree yeah. to work with a first, a quote unquote, first time director, totally. uh, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a great question. And so basically, you know, going back, I was, yeah, 2017 or 2018, I'm thinking, what is my first feature? What, like, what? what will it be, <laughs> you know? And there were a couple, like I was thinking maybe go, you know, try to make something like, and I was very inspired by the Duplass brothers who's, you know, I like their films by sensibility as you could probably tell from the trailer, there's absolutely nothing like that at all, <clears throat> but I really like their stuff. And I, I loved what they've had to say about any film, just go out and do it. So I thought, okay, maybe I could make something for like 10 grand or 50 grand even, right? And do a Kickstarter or whatnot. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't quite have a story that fit that budget. Exactly. So I was sort of like, mm. and then there was a film that actually, you know, an agent had sent to me that was like a, a home invasion thriller. Um, that was like, you know, maybe like, like a small budget, but an offer to direct something, but you know, the script didn't even work and the writers of it didn't really like want to change anything. So I realized I was like, if I shoot this, I'm just going to be a traffic cop basically. And I'm not really going to have any like, you know, not contributing much. And so I, I kind of left that project, which, you know, uh, people might get like, why are you doing that? <laughs> but I, I Right. Just, it was, a, it was a gig. That's a, that's a really I, interesting it's thing. It's a gig. Yeah. But I didn't want to do, you know, cause one thing about, you know, directing a movie, as we know, 
you're you're signed to that for life. You know, that's a 25 to life <laughs> on a movie, you know? Um, and so look, I mean, movies don't always turn out how you want and, you know, every director, should, you know, has to take risks and swings and some of my favorites, you know, have taken like real swings and sometimes they're not understood in their time. But, you know, at the very least, I think you got to be able to wake up and say, you know what, like I did something I wanted to do or I'm proud of or has my heart in it or whatnot. And so I was in this awkward time. So cut back a little earlier, I'm 14. I wanted to be an FBI agent before I was uh, a filmmaker. And I used to go on the FBI's top 10 list with the dreams and hopes of helping the FBI catch a fugitive. And it's at this time that the face of Jason Derrick Brown enters my life. You know, you got a sea of menacing faces, Osama bin Laden, Whitey Bulger, right? And then the surfer dude from Southern California. So the face stands out to me. And I'm like, what's that? That's interesting. Cut to 12 or so, maybe 13 years later, I'm figuring out what's my first feature. Hmm. So I'm storyboarding uh, a shoot. I think it was a, for a really bad dentistry commercial that I also used a fake name on. And uh, <laughs> I, all of a sudden, as I'm storyboarding, I always have documentaries on in the background. And the face of Jason Derrick Brown just popped onto the screen. Again, it was the first time I'd seen it in like since, you know, age 14. And I'm like, that's crazy. This guy's still missing. What, like, what happened here? What's the story? And so I became absolutely obsessed with the story, you know, because it was, you know, this charismatic con man who becomes this bank robber. Just really, it, it stuck to me. And, you know, I have a great writing mentor um, named Billy Ray, who always says that yeah, really. if he, if, yeah, and he's a great guy, um, you know, he has a, in his lectures, he's very like tough. Um, you know, in terms of like, he's very like, you know, cutting through the delusions. <laughs> it, oh no, he's an in your face kind of guy from what I've seen. But he's a great human being. I mean, he's like just a heartfelt, good guy. Does so much for political causes, everything. He's a real mentor and mensch of a human. Um, and he, he's his big philosophy always is: if I don't wake up in the morning thinking about the project, I don't say yes. Now he's in a position to turn down projects, which a lot of us aren't. But he, you know, he says if I don't wake up thinking about it in the shower, I'm not. I shouldn't do it. And I think it's kind of similar about a film. And so I kept waking up thinking about Jason Derrick Brown. So this could be a really cool movie. And it, it felt like it to me. So at first I thought, hmm, maybe I'll try to write it and sell it as a script because it might be too ambitious for a first movie. You know, this would need probably, you know, some, some cachet behind it. So I kind of, but I thought just give it a go as a script because why, why not? And so I wrote this script. And at the time I had known this actor, Jonathan Groff, who um, was about to be on the show Mind Hunter, and I Such knew him because so yeah, good. yeah, so and and he, I knew him because I used to tape his auditions in the William Morris mailroom. Mm -hmm. ah. And so after my short did decently for me, I got in touch with him through his agents, I think, and I said to him, "Hey, would you like to be in this? You know, I'm writing a script for you." And he was like, "Oh, that sounds." And he pitched it to him. He said, "That sounds cool. Well, send it to me, and you know, we'll see." And so he read it a few months later. He really liked it. And, uh, but I don't think his agents did. <laughs> and he wanted to do it though. And so we kind of were like, I was like, great. So I have this guy and I have, he's got a show that's about to come out with David Fincher. That's pretty cool. And so I was kicking the thing around. It was hard to get people to read it. So to go to the proof of concept story, I go into a company one day um, and I pitched the script and, you know, I pitched that John you know, wants to do it. And they're like, mm, you know, they seem have five out of 10 interested, so not great. Um, and so I'm leaving and this guy kind of pulls me aside and he goes, you need to do a proof of concept uh, of this script. And I kind of like looked at him and I was like, oh yeah, like another short, great. <laughs> you know, that's the last thing I want to do right now. I've done at this point, maybe eight, right? I'm like, you know, how many more shorts can I do? What am I going to need? What do I need to prove? And the guy said a very smart line, which said, you've proven you can direct with those shorts, but you have not proven you can direct this. And I uh, was like, damn, that's pretty smart. So he gave me kind of a different instruction. Though. This guy really kind of gave me, he was like, but don't try to make a short work as a short, right? Because like what makes a great short film? And I honestly, I even though some of my shorts did win awards, I would say I never made a great short film personally. Um, I made some very well made ones possibly in areas for the time mm -hmm. of being a student. You know, I didn't make Pioneer by David Lowry ever or Curfew by uh, Sean Christensen. Like, you know, those were shorts that really like, you know, had that or even Martin McDonough's short that really broke in. Like those shorts had like real 
you know, payoff structure, all that. Right. Um, my shorts are like really like good trailers for features. Right. <laughs> so that's exactly you know? what you needed. That's exactly you know? what you needed. And so I went for American Murder. I decided just to shoot one scene. Um, and we shoot uh, one of we shot one of the climactic scenes of a SWAT invasion. We did it all in one shot. Um, and I got Jonathan to do it. And when I made that, when I shot that scene and put it up on IMDb, all of a sudden Mindhunter dropped. And then a lot of people were interested in reading the script and wanting to know about it. So the guy was totally right. The script did become a really valuable calling card. Uh, the call, the short became a very good calling card for the screenplay. However, it did not walk me into a deal. You know, So I would say that I think what you were saying earlier is, is accurate and that it can help you get a step ahead, but it's not necessarily going to secure a thing because what right. happened was then people were reading the script by that point it got a lot better so people were interested but some were interested in me not doing it because it was like ambitious and you know we'll take the script and run with it thank you but i wasn't interested in that and then two different producers slash companies kind of came into my orbit that were very supportive of me directing it and i was traveling picture show company my producers kevin madison and carissa buffell and gg films gia walsh those two came at me from different angles around the same time. They now debate who came first. Uh, it was G, G, I think Kevin and Chris. Uh, and they um, they saw my short, they read my script, they saw my other shorts and they were like, okay, we'll develop this with you and we'll go through a process and we'll get it out to the right actors. And they, they really helped me, you know, because that process of working with them, you know, we developed the script for a year, roughly, I think. And it was an option for me and they were giving me notes and I was doing rewrites and that was my, my professional writing school. Right. Um, you know, and then after that, we finished the script, you know, and we're like, okay, it's ready to go out for casting now. Awesome. And it's uh, March 1st, 2020. So at that <laughs> point we're thinking, you know, we don't know where the world's going to go. We're thinking, yeah, we'll be filming in, you know, the third quarter of 2020 and get, get an actor touch and let's go. And then it didn't really look like it was going to happen, you know, for a little while. But what I decided to do in the pandemic, I was working, I had remote work as a script reader. So I was, you know, fortunately I was able to keep working, but in my off hours, all I did was prepare with my team nonstop, my cinematographer. And I shot listen to script six times. I've worked with her on all my thesis shorts and same with my editors. You know, I, one of them was doing pre-visualization with me on all the set pieces. So we were like, let's hitch up this thing. Let's map out every shot and like be ready to go for tomorrow. And I was, it was nice because it helped keep people's morale up in a time when it was not, you know, not great. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, we were getting, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the big thing about getting this movie made specifically, because it's really all about the character of Jason Derrick Brown was getting the right actor. And by this point, Jonathan was no longer available. He was shooting the Matrix and, you know, millions of other things because Mindbender blew him up into, you know, exponential proportions. Um, he's the nicest guy and, you know, we had the, mm -hmm. the most amicable party for the project. But now we needed to find our Jason. And um, Tom Pelfrey came onto my radar because my producer, Gia Walsh, was watching Ozark and she said, the Matthew, this guy is dynamite. And I had actually never watched Ozark. So I was like, okay, I guess I got to watch Ozark. And I did. It's great. Oh, no, it was a great show. But he was phenomenal. And it was very clear that he was the guy. You know, like you have a lot of people on lists mm -hmm. in this business and whatever. But it became very quick, clear, quick that he was the right actor to play this character. Um, the right. physicality, the right you know, range and, and all of that. Um, and so we sent him the script. He came. He became attached, and then once he got attached, the other actors came around. Ryan that. and yeah, everybody else started. Yeah. Come. So, so you had a producer. You had a producing team helping you put this thing, whole thing together. The financing, I'm assuming, they helped to put together as well. Once the cast came on, so you yeah. had you had a team that, around you putting this together. That was all. Though. Yeah. No, I mean, I could take credit for writing the script and directing the movie. <laughs> I cannot take credit for financing of that, and I have very little to do with that other than giving them the material we needed. Exactly. So, so, all right. So you're off, you're off and running, you're making your film. Um, is there a day as directors, we always have that day that everything comes crashing down around you. What was that day for you and how did you overcome it? I love that question. I've heard you ask that one before, uh, but I don't know if I was prepared for it. So I'll be on the fly. Um, the day when everything came crashing. I mean, look, you know how film is. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. The first day we filmed, filmed um a scene that took place on a boat party um so we heard film you know and the first thing we shot actually was quite easy it was just like 
Tom's character, Jason, shooting targets in a national park. So we're getting nice, beautiful wide shots. It's just one actor, you know, it's a gun and some squibs on the paper plate and shooting, but really not too complicated. We're like, okay, we got this. And you're like, oh, yeah, and I, I think I heard, I think I heard, yeah, you know, I think I heard Lauren Hannaway, the uh, director of The Novice. She was talking about how, like, you know, there's always a feeling of when you're directing at first and it's going like, oh, this is, directing's easy. I just do this, no problem. Um, <laughs> you know, or even even Paul Schrader said in an interview, he was like, yes, Charlie Rose, I think, asked him, like, is directing a hard job? And he was like, well, it's not a hard job. It's just a, it, it's hard if you want to make a great film <laughs> or a good film, but it's not like yeah. you think about it in theory, it's like, it's quite, you know, comfortable as a job, as far as jobs go. But uh, anyway, so we filmed the paper plate shooting. We descend the mountain to go into this beautiful lake and shoot a scene where this character is filming himself having a lavish boat party where he's like doing drugs, and what, mm-hmm. you know, wild stuff. Um, and we get to the boat and the winds start blowing us 40 miles per fucking hour on the lake <laughs> and they're spinning us around and boom, 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 boom. And so I'm like, oh my God, we're not going to have sound. We're not gonna, you know, also, it was a small boat. We were filming us. The only crew that could be there were me, my, my cinematographer who was operating and our sound man and my ED. So it was four people on the boat crew and then 12 or so extras and, and lead, lead actors. So it was just a... Um, and it was funny because as I was walking to the set, you know, I see all these, I see trailers, I see honey wagons and, and, and stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like a, a, a real movie. movie. We're making a real movie. Like I, I, I'm here. And then I'm on the boat and my camera operator is hanging on the thing and the sound guy's trying to get in. And I'm like, this feels, it's film school still. Nothing changed. It's the same shit. <laughs> The, the honey wagons and trailers are are fooling nobody, you know? It's exactly it's, right. It's, it's the ex- same. It never changes. You're still chasing the day. You're still just sneaking under the radar. You're trying to get like, every day is like robbing a bank, uh, you know, and you're just trying to get the shots you need. Because we filmed the movie quite, you know, in 22 shooting days. So it's, like, it's an intense shoot and a lot to get in with action elements and SWAT invasions. And murders, yeah, so yeah, 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 it, it, and and it's, yeah. And it's not all in one location either. So it's like, it's... No, you're... no, we had 27. 27 Jesus. Movies, 27 days. So it was, oh. it, was, it was a pretty intense, it was an intense shoot. But honestly, though, I gotta say, as hard as it was, and you know, intense as it was, it was also incredibly rewarding because here we were in this time. We filmed, you know, December 2020, November 2020, and did some second year early 2021. So we were filming pre-vaccine, you know, pandemic. Right. And we were getting to do what we loved. You know, my cinematographer, like I said, was my classmate from AFI. My editor, you know, was also, both my editors were classmates of mine. So to, to, to be able to do, my producers, you know, I, I'd known by this point, by the time we started filming for at least two or three years. Right. So, you know, I'm getting to basically make a movie with my friends, you know, on a pretty, you know, for first time director, at quite a nice scale. So it was really nice to be able to do that. Um, And, you know, so even though it was insane (laughs) uh, and with a cast that far exceeded any, actually to answer your other question, you know, how this cast come together. I mean, if, you know, by the time we were making offers to people like Ryan Phillippe, Jackie Weaver, and Adina Menzel or Moises Arias or Chantel, all these people would have, if it wasn't COVID, would have probably been busy. Right. They would have been on their, you know, Adina tours all the time. Right, Ryan's con- Ryan works more than anyone I know. Tom the same. Like they're all, you know, Chantel like just is a, is always on a show. So it would have been really hard to I think get these people. Um, and so you know, I was definitely and certainly Jack Waver, a two time Oscar nominee, playing you know a great but small part. So it, it just um, oh, there are no small parts, only small actors. I know Judith, um, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, you know, yeah, to have that luxury. Um, you know, I mean, uh, it's insane. No, it's it's insane. great. It was hard, but I, but I, I have to accept. It. And since you've already directed, I mean, in some of your short films, you were directing some very seasoned actors as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you when you're working with you know the kind of caliber of actors that you were working on in this project, I mean, you have to believe there's some intimidation, maybe, or like how do you approach a two time Oscar nominee? You know, how do you how did you kind of work with those actors to get them to where you wanted to be? as a first time director, because it's, it's, it's a very different, you know, when you're Ridley Scott, this is not a conversation. I would never ask Ridley right. Scott this um, because he's, he's gotten, right. he's not 
40,000 hours on set. Uh, no, no exaggeration right. either by that time. But That's when you're right. first, and he's so oh, confident. <laughs> oh my God. You just walk in. I, uh, on a side note here, I was remember I, talk, I was talking to somebody who was working with Tony Scott and he was on a commercial and it was like five helicopters, like a bunch of stallions running down in the desert and like, you know, cars, like all this craziness. And someone's like, Tony, you, are you, are you like nervous? He goes nervous. And he's like smoking a cigar. He's like, <laughs> this is vacation for me. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, man. I love him. You know, oh, he's, you uh, he's one of my favorite directors. Uh, oh, he's actually the one director. He's the one director who has my birthday. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm big on birthdays. Oh, uh, nice. I'm, I'm so happy to join these guys. I'm like, what a great director to share a birthday. With. But, uh, <laughs> so anyway, he, so, so uh, how did you? He was so the how best. Did, yeah. He was the best. There's no question. He he changed the acting. He changed action films. And by the way, he, he discovered Ryan Phillippe in film. Um, which movie was he know, about? In which movie? Crimson, Crimson Tide was Ryan's first movie. And uh, Ryan was in Crimson Tide? Really? Mm -hmm. Oh wow! I, I have to double check. That was before Cruel Intentions, obviously. Yeah, a few years, yeah. I think. If I a think, couple years, because Crimson Time was, I think, early nineties. Um, yeah, it was early nineties, yeah, well, but it was all about yeah, Gene Hackman and Denzel. Yeah, and he was on TV first. Ryan, uh, he has mm -hmm. a he has a very interesting story about how he broke in, but I'll let him tell. But um, yeah, and Tony Scott, I know, was like a mentor to him, and he just did an interview. I, I only learned this recently, Simon, because I know him. I have to next next time I see him, I will ask him more about it. But he said, yeah, he like lived in Tony Scott's guest house and he was like the kindest guy and mentor. And yeah. So very, very cool. So how did Anyways. you approach working with these actors? Uh, well, you know, like like we said, yes, these are incredible actors. I am a first time director. And you know, naturally, you know, you're gonna, even if you're as confident as Ridley and Tony Scott are, you're gonna have some insecurities, you know. Um, but I found look, I mean, I, you know, the thing is every actor and Judith. This is a Judith quote, and I'm glad I had her. Um, you know, every actor is different. They all have a different language. And, you know, your job as a director is kind of figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily try to figure them out and pinpoint them and be like, okay, I know, you know, but figure out how they work, what they need, you know, so some actors like peak early in terms of their takes, right? Some actors are like coming real hot, take one, two, three. Some actors need more to find it, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, Jack Nicholson famously is like amazing on take one. And then he kind of does the same thing, right? Or some, there's all these six stories about how they, how they work. Leonardo DiCaprio apparently likes to take a lot of takes to get to where he wants to go, you know? And, and so there's no one way, um, you know, that said, I got to say, I don't mean to be falsely modest. Like I felt so as a director taken care of by these guys, because they were all so good in different ways Yeah, I know, yeah. that I didn't really feel that I had to do too much. Like, micromanaging or anything like that ever um and i'm not that way with actors because i personally again talk you know all the things judith talks about in her not just her book but also in our you know consultations that you know she read many versions of the script and worked me on it closely and you know it's always about first thing comes down to is the relationships you know, what are the relationships of the movie that are the most important and that's how i would kind of work when i would work the um with the actors and say like we did zoom rehearsals um you know we would really I, I would focus like one day would be all right tom and adina the next day would be ryan and adina because they have all the interrogations or you know some scenes i couldn't rehearse i didn't have that some scenes i didn't have luxury but i did have some significant zoom rehearsals and chances to work with tom and i mean they each were different tom you know came so prepared knew his part so well um and you know it was really fun because he would sometimes go off the page and ad lib and, and do incredible things. But, you know, I'd say is that in terms of the intimidation of being a first time director and having these high caliber actors, you know, one pretty great moment was we were filming a scene and this will also answer your, when it all went wrong story. Um, you know, we were filming a scene and I think we're like midway in the shoot. Things seemed to be going quite well overall, you know, there's always times, but overall it's like we're making our days. We, we're, we're getting good stuff. You know, the actors are great. And then we're filming one scene with the three actors, I talked about this on the commentary where they just like, it, the scene wasn't working. You know, you just, you get there, it's, it was written, you know, you, you know, we read it in a rehearsal, we, we talked about it and then we get to the set and it's just not there. Mm -hmm. um, like something about it's awkward, not right. The tone's off, you know, they don't feel present. They're, they're struggling to engage. So 
I couldn't really tell what was going on, but I took the three actors aside and I said, and these were all great actors, and I said, listen, something's wrong on the page. You know, I, I, I failed you. I, I don't know what, I didn't get it right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wrote so many drafts of the script, but this scene seems to have stumped me and us. So can you help me? Like figure out what's on what's up here and how can we make this work? Like, what can I do? Can I give I can I can rewrite lines for you right now? Like, what do we need? And the actors all looked at me, and some of them were new that day too. And I think it helped them really lower their guard and be like, okay, this guy's gonna work with me. And we figured it out and the scene plays beautifully, you know. And so I had moments like that, you know, where it just was like sometimes just you know, being like, like I had everything in this movie in my mind, like so prepared, storyboarded right. the whole, yeah. storyboarded the whole thing, <laughs> rehearsals, you know, the, the the COVID prep. It's the COVID. Scene, it's called the COVID scene, yeah. the COVID, scene breakdowns of every scene, costumes, wardrobe, every little thing oh, yeah. that I could think mm-hmm. of, I did. And then you know, you get there and things change. But you know, I think something Jackie Weaver said to me, um, because every actor I worked with, I made a point to ask them either whether it was in the rehearsal or the phone call before, you know, they come to set. Because I do think it's important to try to meet actors before they show up in some way. Sometimes it's not possible to meet them in person for a coffee, but if you can do that, I think that's the best. Um, but I I called up, uh, you know, I remember talking to Jack, and I would always ask him, how do you like to work? That was only my number one question. If I didn't get anything in, get that one, right? How do you like to work? What can I, you know, and what, and then I would also ask him, because a lot of these people, you know, Tom was coming from David Fincher, right? <laughs> Ryan has worked with Robert Altman and Clint Eastwood and has stories about them, you know. Um, Chantel, some of the best TV directors, you know, Jackie, David O. Russell, and like, you know, the, the heaviest of heavy hitters, right? So, you know, I would ask them, like, what are the, in your experience, what do the best directors do? You know, and something Jack, they all basically actually said the same thing, which was the best directors are prepared, organized, but flexible. That was the recurring answer. So they would always mm-hmm. have a plan, you know, they would have their, their shit together more or less, but they were also flexible for changes. Cause I think that's like, sometimes people are just, and especially writer directors, like I, I know you are, you know, we get like, you know, we can be very protective of our work, you know, you know, so I think having that flexibility to let people's ideas come in, but also there's a danger of being too flexible, right? No, you like, gotta, you gotta guide them in. Yeah. We, well, you gotta, you, you gotta think, think. And then you're not really making a movie anymore. Yeah. You're just like, <laughs> right. shooting but, let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. Why not? Let's just try it. And then you're right. like, we've only, we've only done a quarter of a page, uh, right. exactly. a third of a exactly. third of a page <laughs> all day. Sorry. We didn't make our day. Um, uh, yeah, so, there, so there's one scene in the movie, uh, you know, that, I always love asking directors this because this is a very awkward scenario for directors is the love scenes, mm. man. How the hell did you shoot some of these love scenes in the movie? <laughs> they're intense. And also, I mean, it's an awkward, it's not sexy. It's not a sexy thing. It's awkward right. for the, for the talent. It's awkward for you. Like anytime I've ever had to do something like that, it's just like how, you know, and I was doing it coming up in the nineties and the early two thousands. Where, right. you know, there wasn't uh, a, an intimacy, you know, right. uh, agent on, I forgot what it is, an intimacy person on set to kind of guide mm-hmm. you through the process. How do you approach that scene and how do, how do you make the actors feel comfortable and do you clear the set? What, how do you work that? Um, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, and that, that did, those did, I was not scared of the action, but I was a little scared of that. Um, right. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's rough. Like, you know, it's a rough, yeah, it's it's a rough shooting, yeah, right. it's, it's definitely, it's, you know, I mean, look, I think number one, yeah, you have to have an NFC coordinator. There's really no way around that. And of course, like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> right. Right. Um, so we, we had an NFC coordinator. We, you know, did clear the set as much as we could for, you know, other than the person operating the camera or whatnot. Um, but everyone who did not need to be there would be out in a way, um, you know, and it's about making the actors as comfortable as possible. It's, it's hard to, what I made sure to do when I shot those scenes was to be very clear about what I wanted and needed and to not, uh, as much as I love him, be David Fincher on that day. <laughs> do a hundred, you know, like, get what you need. <laughs> what you need and, One more time. Yeah. One no, more yeah. time. Yeah, what you need and get out and, you know, try to make you be sensitive to that because right. like, acting is very hard. You know, I, I think I once said to, and I'm, none of my actors were difficult and that's the truth like you know i hate to sound so boring but really none of them were and um 
you know, there's one time when I know one of them was like, I'm sorry if I'm like, you know, this is hard for me. I'm figuring this out. And I was like, listen, you know, my job is hard as director. I'm not gonna say it's not, but I don't have to be up in front of that camera and I don't gotta get vulnerable in front of that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I can hide behind a camera. I can hide behind my script pages. You can't, you gotta be vulnerable and truthful. And to get yourself to that place is very hard. And an intimacy scene really is no different. It's just, it happens to be a, a physical component. So it's just, yeah, it's important. I think to be sensitive to people and making sure they have what they need and you know uh hiring the right people to do the job fair enough fair enough now where when is this uh when is the film coming out and where can people watch it uh the film will be coming out october 21st in select theaters and then it will be out october 28th it'll still be in theaters but it'll also be on demand and digital platforms so you can rent it on all transactional vod um so yeah that's awesome dude now i'm gonna ask you a few questions to ask all my guests what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? You know, um, I think some trying to be a director, you know, I think learn, I think forcing yourself to write scripts is very valuable and important. Yeah. Even if, you know, you're not a good writer or you don't think you're a good writer. A lot of good writers don't think they're good writers <laughs> and a lot of bad writers think they're great writers. So I think, um, you know, cause for me, what really moved the needle forward was writing um writing my screenplays and you know because I had to write myself into the director's chair um personally um I do think making lots of shorts is great I think short films are an incredible training ground I know they work for me and I know they work for a lot of people I know so I think making short films I think writing constantly and I think you know I'm going to go back to Billy Ray you know he says you have to you have to outwork everyone that doesn't mean it's such like a competition like it's outwork you know, Matthews have to outwork Alex Ross, but outwork yourself. You know, I think constantly push yourself to to do better, to be better. And that's something I know I'm taking myself right now. Even, you know, I made a movie that is my first feature and in many ways I'm very proud of, but I'm also trying to learn how I can be better as a sure. filmmaker and how I can go up because this is my first ideal, <laughs> not my last. So I think, you know, yeah. And I think the tenacity is really important because it's very easy to lose momentum in the process of a movie. Hmm. As a, as a director, I do believe you are responsible for charging the coal because I think that's what everyone comes around. You know, um, I've seen a lot of movies fall apart, whether it's in development or whatnot, because, or even post, like, you know, they get taken away because the director kind of checks out. So I think as a director, when you go to make a movie, you got to be ready to be like, okay, I'm going to spend, I can give three to five years to this thing. Cause it's not just making the movie. It's like you said, it's selling it for distribution. It's, uh, and I've said it myself many times, like even now doing interviews, I was like, I said, I had to go, Oh man, if I hated this movie, I'd be so miserable. <laughs> you, gotta, right. you, gotta, you gotta get people to see it. It's an endless grind and then you, you're associated with it. So I think, you know, yeah, my advice would be to have the tenacity and, Make sure that, you know, the project you're doing and the film you're investing your time in is something you really want to do more than anything else. Um, three film, three of your favorite films of all time. Three of your, uh, so my first favorite film is uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, seen it so many times on 70 millimeter on the big screen. Mm -hmm. um, Ron, uh, 1985 Kurosawa, total masterpiece that just blows my mind every time. And um, the third one I will go with for this one is I'll say The Godfather and Deep Warrior. But, you know, upon my meeting Coppola and, and, and all of that, I just, you know, I've seen that movie not three times this year and it just continues to hold up. And, did you see and, Did you see The Offer? I have not. I heard it's great. I loved I, it. I love, if you're a filmmaker, you're going to love The Offer. It's just That's so what they're saying, yeah. Because it got kind of, you know, the critics weren't, they don't get it, it. They, but people <laughs> but people are loving it I, i've heard i've had like 10 people say you gotta see the offer guys i so, mean if you're a filmmaker you've got to watch there's this, this very few quality projects out there about filmmaking and that's just you're sitting there going what the what happened here <laughs> it's like it's crazy okay, and we'll I go back I, to that. I, I think i found it all right go for so it. the lesson that's taken me the longest to learn i think is to you never say never. <laughs> I think that's something I, I continue to learn. Like I get to a phase of film where I'm like, I'm never going to work with that person again, or I'm never going to make that mistake again. And I'm never going to, you know, do this kind of movie, that kind of movie. And I think that while it's great to have a clear vision of what you want in your career, mm -hmm. I think 
being open to possibilities and you know not trying to control everything because as directors we love control <laughs> yep. you know we love that and i think learning the biggest the lesson then might be learning that actually you're not in control oh, oh it's all. no no as a yeah. director you are barely you're just trying to scrape some shots together for the day you are you have no control over weather you have no control over locations you don't have Nothing. no control over an actor not being able to get there or, or being difficult or a crew member who thinks he knows better than you or she knows better than you and giving you hassles and politics and fight you, you, when you start listing the stuff a director truly just like what wakes up and goes well, I hope something's going to happen today. Right. right. <laughs> Let's, I hope. Yeah. I mean, the, the, is the camera working? Step one. Good. Yeah. Everyone here? Step two. Good. Oh, where's food? Is there no food? Okay, no food. No lunch, everybody. Okay, so now we got to figure that out. Like, it's just, just very little you can control. But when you're there, you're just, it's a carnival, man. It's a, we're carnies. It's a oh, carnival. Yes. It's, but it's this insanity that, as I call it, the beautiful sickness that once you get bitten, it's with you and you can't get rid of oh, it yeah. ever, 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 ever. And it makes you do insane things. Uh, oh, yeah. Get, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to get it does. No delusions about that, man. Yeah. it's <laughs> No, but it's a play. I mean, to be able to direct and write and, you know, like in some regards, I don't think doing a, script, a movie at a hundred million is very different from doing a movie at 5,000. Like it's all there, you know, there, of course there are differences, but it is at the end of the day, it's storytelling and it's narrative and it's art and, you know, finding a way to make things work. You know, you look at the biggest directors talking, like I love listening to interviews with Scorsese and he's still talking like he just started, you know, he's, yeah. Yeah. Like, he's like figuring it out or Spielberg too, the same thing. He's like, I wake up and I have no idea what I'm doing or I want to call in sick. Right. It's, you know, so I think, yeah, I think being able to embrace that being out of control is something that I'm going to have to keep learning. I'm sure all of you, you and our listener and your listeners are. Yeah. Too. And there's, I forgot what director said this, but I, that I interviewed on the show, but it was one of these big, you know, kind of heavy hitter directors I've had on the show. And they were telling me, that, yeah, I was doing this movie. It was like a hundred million dollar movie, studio movie. And then we went down the street and stole this shot. I'm like, you, what, you, what? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just like between takes, everybody was setting up and I just grab a camera at my DP and the actors and went down the street and just stole these shots. I'm like, you're stealing shots at a hundred million dollars. He goes, yeah, dude, it never ends. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I'm like, this is great. Cause, cause you think, you know, you're sitting there in your reclining chair, like Peter Jackson was in, uh, in Lord of the Rings. And nope. you, it's just like, no, no, it's no. <laughs> You always have, you always have a day to make, you know, you always have, there's never you got pages, enough, you got pages, never, never enough, enough time. time, never enough time, never enough money, you know, never enough time, never enough money. It's uh it's, but we're here and that's why we love doing it, man. Uh, oh, Matt, yeah. man, I appreciate you coming on the show, brother. Congratulations on your new film. And I wish you the best with it and, uh, you, and, keep, and keep, and keep making movies, man. Keep doing what you love doing and, and getting, getting these stories out there that you want to tell my friend, but uh, congratulations. Seriously. You are, at the top one to 0.1% of all filmmakers, wow. you made a movie and Thank it's, you know, with, with a budget and with a cast and that is good. And it, it's, a, it's a rare thing in this world that we, we live in. So uh, be very proud of yourself, my friend. So thanks again. Alex, thank you so much. And thank you for all that you do for filmmakers and for the films you make too. So thank you. And thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And this was a great fun interview.